Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the University of Urbino. Togliamo la mascherina. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, we are here to, to award to colleagues, Professor Victor Bam Bampuccian and uh, Vincenzo De Risi. Uh, they, are, they are being awarded uh, by uh, the Commandino Medal and the Del Monte Medal. These two medals are assigned on the base of their work on history of science and fun fundamentals of science. And we are very happy that, that we are able to, to do it in present this year. And so these are the awards that were supposed to, to be assigned last, last academic year. 2021. Let me read the, the two motivations for, 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 for their work. Um, so the, the first medal has been assigned to, again, Professor Victor Bampuchan and for his contributions to the comprehension of the foundations of geometry, through which he highlighted new and important results, of often turning an explored path into fertile grounds for research. Thank you. And uh, the second motivation is for the, uh, it's been, it, on, on which it has been based uh, the, the, the awarding of the, um, of the second medal to Professor Vincenzo De Risi for his contributions to a, a rigorous analysis of the, of the concept of space and its historical and theoretical development and for the advancements he made possible on the comprehension of ancient and modern geometry. Thank you. So, Professor Laerte Sorini, the floor is yours. I'm very pleased to represent the Center of Studies Urbino e la Prospettiva, especially on this occasion in which uh, two distinguished professors, such as Victor Pambuchan, and Vincenzo Zerisi are awarded. As you know, it is the 600th anniversary of the birth of Duke Federico, and this mainly thanks to his clever contribution. If today we can talk about Federico Comandino medal and the award destined for career development and Guidobaldo del Monte medal, which is intended for young researcher and an ideal line between master and disciple. In fact, Duque Federico has the intuition to create a place similar to a crossroad of art and knowledge, a meeting place between art and science, a place in which new forms of art were born. Our center of studies has a 20-year history during which it has the audacity to follow the Duke Federico's legacy by promoting knowledge organizing conference, film review, seminars on the subject of science, and this dissemination. Within the center, we also published a prestigious review of book. We won national and international projects such as Formelle of the Ducal Palace of Urbino, one of the best Italian founded projects, and we organized international exhibitions such as the one entitled Sapientia Pietias at Ozium al Tempo del Duca Federico, which will be inaugurated on June 4 at the Albani Museum. And we give prize such as those we are assigned here today to Victor and Vincenzo, who join the list of well-known 
colleagues already awarded, such as Ravian Ness, William Renescia, Enrico Gamba, Sir Roger Penrose, Jürgen Rand, and many others. The mission of the center is today confirmed in creating a network of a people and disseminating their common knowledge with an activity of public engagement impacting on social welfare. Thank you all for being present and a long life to the center, Urbino La Prospettiva. And now, Vincenzo Fano. Thank you very much, uh, Laerte. Uh, I am here uh, bringing the, the greeting by our head of the department, the Department of Pure and Applied Sciences, a uh, department in which uh, science and uh, history of science, the philosophy, logic uh, uh, are together. It's an interdisciplinary uh, department here in Urbino. Uh, we are very happy of having here in Urbino this department. And uh, Urbino was uh, in uh, in the 60th century, a place where uh, Federico Comandino and Guido Baldo, two very distinguished scholars, uh, built a sort of bridge uh, between humanities uh, and uh, science that uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, also today living. Um, Federico Comandino and Guido Baldo were scholars uh, very good mathematician and, and uh, physicist, at the same time also very good uh, uh, scholar in ancient uh, uh, literature. They are able to understand Archimede, Archimedes, uh, Euclid, and so forth. And so forth. So uh, they, they brought in the modernity, uh, the thinking, and the work of this very important scientist of antiquity. From uh, Guido Baldo and Comandino Galilei uh, take uh, take the step and uh, begin the scientific revolution, a uh, very important uh, event uh, in the general history of Europe. Um, so in Urbino we have these two medals and I am very happy that two, two medals, one for, for the career, one for the early career in history of science here in Urbino and I am very happy that Jan, uh, Jan Pambuchan uh, that is now our visiting professor in uh, Foundation in the History of Geometry, and Di Vincenzo, that was uh, before the pandemic's uh, visiting professor, also with us for many months in Urbino, giving courses in history of science. I am very happy that both received today this uh, uh, important. Uh, recognition uh, on history of science uh, and uh, I hope that uh, this discipline will be uh, more and more important uh, in, in our university. Thank you very much. The program go on with the Lectio, Lectio Magistralis of Victor Pambuchan. Okay.
Ah, oh, this thing. Okay, thanks. Oh, many thanks for uh, the honor. Sure. I am uh, going to say a few things about uh, being a geometer, one that doesn't use any other methods but those of geometry, and about uh, the fact that Comandino is still very much of relevance today, that the project of becoming Greek isn't one that is accomplished ever. So, where does the title of my talk, which is uh, what uses a geometer in times of need, it comes from Hölderlin's poem where he says, Und wozu Dichter in dürftiger Zeit? Aber sie sind, sagst du, wie des Weingotts heilige Priester, welche von Land zu Land zogen in heiliger Nacht. This he wrote around 1800, but it was unknown for most of the 19th century. It was discovered in about 1894. In English translation, this would sound like what use is a poet in times of need. But you will say, they are like the holy priests of the, of the wine god, moving from land to land in holy night. Now, what was Hölderlin referring to by the times of need? What he was referring to, which comes out of the very long elegy, is the absence of gods, what we would call disenchantment. So, what's the connection with geometry? I mean, is geometry poetry? The way I understand it, it is. It is pure poetry. Um, why is it poetry? Well, because it creates a world out of words, just like poetry does. And it is pure because it's independent of these languages that come and go, where about every 800 years they become incomprehensible. In other words, we can still understand what Euclid meant, unless you are a very extreme purist and you think that only a Greek can understand that and nobody understands it anymore. But in general, we can say that we can still understand what it's about. Although poetry from that time, unless you're an expert in ancient Greek, and even then, you wouldn't have the context and the times, the really living then, we can consider them gone. So, what are the times of need for somebody like me? You know, I'm born way after there were no more gods and many other things. So, it's uh, more troublesome than times of disenchantment or the loss of cultural references that T.S. Eliot deplores in his wasteland. It's the fact that one knows by the time one graduates from high school that one doesn't need the hypothesis of nuclear weapons for the end of civilization. The fact that peaceful, everyday living suffices to bring it to an end. So the times of need are, are more immediate than um, the times of spiritual need. So what does one do in this kind of situation? When on a private level one tries to choose a refuge into something where one wouldn't contribute to the direction of society that one disagrees with. But 
isn't pure mathematics enough of a refuge? Why choose geometry? Um, well, pure geometry is pretty much on the demise for ever since the 17th century, let's say. And this, I think, is a kind of disenchantment inside mathematics. Um, so what do I mean by pure geometry? I mean a geometry where only geometric axioms are allowed. In other words, you're, you can't use algebra or other means, uh, you know, embellish it with more than purely geometric thoughts that are encapsulated in axioms. The decline was marked in the 19th century already, where a so-called arithmetization set in. In other words, the idea that all you need is the natural numbers, that all of mathematics can somehow be subsumed to that. But the decline started in the 17th century. I mean, Newton complained about it. Um, what are its competitors? One can't say that geometry dis disappeared from the uh, picture. It still exists, but it exists in the versions of differential geometry, topological geometry, algebraic topology, geometry. So the first two, differential and topological geometry, stem from a belief that continuity is an essential component of the actual outside space. Algebraic geometry has a completely different uh, or origin. It, it likes what it can do with a very powerful algebraic apparatus. And that is a completely different thing. I don't think that anybody in algebraic geometry believes that the space outside us gives us some kind of clues that we should work in fields in which every polynomial has a root or something like this. I doubt that. Now, the justification in working in these and not working with pure geometry is manifold. One would be that, well, working in pure geometry is like deciding to climb a mountain with just the things you can do with your own hands. You know, you, you can't use boots that are bought and produced by synthetic fibers and so on. Everything has to be really done by yourself. And you can't go by helicopter. So it sounds like some kind of Luddite. I mean, you're, you're against the times because things have developed and now we have these tools, why would you be against them? So this is one of the reasons. The other is that geometry is after all supposed to be useful, supposed to be describing some outside reality. And that outside reality, the line of reasoning goes, would be akin to the geometry described by differential geometry or topological geometry. Well, David Hilbert already in 1898 knew that that's not the case. He wrote that a homogeneous continuum that would allow indefinite divisibility and would thus achieve the infinitely small cannot be encountered anywhere in nature. The infinite divisibility of the continuum is an operation existing only in thought, only an idea, which is refuted by our observation of nature and by the experience drawn from physics and chemistry. Meanwhile, another approach has appeared, which solidifies Hilbert's take on the difference between our mental notion of continuity, the idea that there is something where space is not like a 
string of beads. It's not something that is one after the other, that there is continuity, that time isn't some kind of a movie where you have sequences one after the other, that it is a continuity, not a discreteness. And this is truly a time of our mind and a space of our mind, but does it correspond to anything outside it? Well, loop quantum gravity, which was, it's a field established by Carlo Rovelli, seeks to unite Einstein's theory of general relativity with quantum mechanics. And according to loop quantum gravity, the universe is not continuous. It is composed of elementary grains or quanta of space. So in other words, it's very different from what differential geometry or topological geometry tells us. People have thought that you can check in the outside world things that your geometry tell you are so. And they have confused the objects of reality with the objects of mathematics. This confusion still is prevalent when you're thinking that geometry ought to describe the outside reality. A German astronomer, Friedrich Zöllner, in 1877, thought to prove that there is a fourth dimension because he thought these um, mediums who disappear things or who do all kinds of crazy things would be justified if there is a fourth dimension. Then objects appear and disappear the way they would appear and disappear to a two-dimensional being. You put this here and it appears and you take it and it disappears. So the same thing would happen in, in uh, Does it, uh, did it work? Well, no, it didn't. He tried some things because usually people disagree with the observations of people in seances. So he thought of producing objects that you could put in some kind of a museum and everybody would agree that that says that there is, a, there is a fourth dimension. And one thing he tried to do was to give the medium two um, rings, lifesavers of, of sorts, made of different kinds of wood. And if this medium would have succeeded in interlocking them like this, then that would be it if you saw two interlocked rings of different kinds of wood then well they have to be interlocked through a fourth dimension the other thing that he had attempted to show was i mean gave the medium was a candle and an empty glass sphere which was closed if you manage to get the candle into the sphere, well then that's again proof because, you know, a hollow sphere has to be blown, it's hot, the candle wouldn't stay intact during the process. Uh, they didn't work. But it's worse that they didn't work. Even if they had worked, the assumptions that these things, that the objects of reality are like things in our geometry is kind of far-fetched. In 1994, in the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research, a journal that was founded in 1884, there was a paper by Song Kong Ji, who described the contents of a film that got the third prize at some Chinese a scientific film competition where a medium looks from a distance at a distance at a um, 
jar, a closed jar that has pills in it. And the pill, it's done with, I don't know, a thousand uh, sequences a second or so. And it shows how the pills go through the wall of the bottle and come out. Some break, others come intact. Okay. Well, I asked a physicist friend, I said, from my point of view, this isn't a big deal because the pill and the jar, they're mostly made of holes, of holes right? I mean, matter isn't what it seems like. You know, it's, I mean, an atom is full of you know, spaces to go through. He said, no, 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 uh, there are uh, uh, forces that prevent this from happening. So it's, the textbook doesn't like this at all. And that reminded me a story that, uh, of a story that uh, an oncologist had, uh, was asked on public radio uh, some 20 years ago why he underwent uh, chemotherapy another 20 years earlier for a tumor that was known to not respond to chemotherapy. So why would he subject himself to this? And he said he hoped that the textbook, that the, the tumor hadn't read the textbook. So I guess the pills and the glass bottle also didn't read the textbook, so they decided to do that. Whichever way it is, it shows that these things, the idea that you know, geometry describes something out there is vastly exaggerated. For example, when we're saying differential geometry, we look at some derivative. So the, the essence is that these functions that form the atlases for differential geometry should be differentiable. And we choose the classical form of differentiability which you see on the picture. However, there is another differentiability introduced by Peano in 1892, which you see below. It looks very similar. In fact, Peano thought that this portrays the concept of the derivative used in the physical sciences much more closely. So why don't we use this one when we describe you know, this, our surfaces and our manifolds in differential geometry? Well, because we have a great theory regarding regular differentiation and a very poor one regarding Peano differentiation. If we chose Peano differentiation, all of differential geometry would collapse. So in other words, we choose our theories because we're good at them, not because they correspond to anything out there. Now, these things are not new at all. In fact, Giordano Bruno told us these things in 1584. Altro è giocare con la geometria, altro è verificare con la natura. And something similar is what Einstein said in 1921. He said, as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they're not certain. And as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. Which is exactly what Bruno had said. But somehow, people are um, more surprised by Einstein than uh, Bruno. However, Einstein also thought in a certain sense that nature should listen to our theories because Ilse Rosenthal Schneider tells us in, uh, that in 1919 a telegram had arrived from Eddington who had gone on this famous solar eclipse expedition confirming the predictions of relativity. And Einstein asked uh, Rosenthal Schneider to read it. And she said, how beautiful, it's almost the value you computed. And Einstein said, I knew that the theory was correct. Did you doubt that? No, sure not. But what would you have said if the confirmation had not come the way it did? In that case, I'd pity the good Lord, for the theory is correct. Da könnt mir halt der liebe Gott leid tun, die Theorie stimmt doch. So, although he in the previous quotation, he tells us that, you know, we should separate the two. In this one, 
he is of the opinion that, well, no. So, so I think we can conclude that the, the excuse that we need to use these things because they reflect the outside world is vastly exagger exaggerated. We can safely conclude that the real numbers, the way we know them, and who, which rely on, on set theory, a late 19th, 19th century invention, are ned, not read off some outside reality. So that the geometry we have and the continuity we have is an inner reality, not an outside reality. So what happened to today's mathematics? Of the two fundamental intuitions, at least in Kant, uh, of time and of space, only the intuition of time forms the basis of contemporary mathematics. The geometry in use today is built upon a foundation involving the set of real numbers, which originates in the intuition of time, or on an algebraic foundation, which also involves time because an algebraic operation is being performed in time. So, all of mathematics becomes a story about operations. Uh, it's computational, I would say, disenchanted in this form. Isaac Yaglom in 1984 wrote that the algebraic geometric diet amounts to two alternative languages, and it is as fundamental as that formed by analytic and synthetic arguments, and that formed by the rational and the mystic approach, or that formed by the left and right halves of the brain. So by, by having cut ourselves off from the geometric side, we have eliminated the mystic approach in the right half of the brain. So, the mathematics taught in school today almost doesn't contain any geometry. And we'll see that this is, has consequences, I would say. What Comandino did with his work, and it's an immense work, because for about a thousand years, Europe was asleep, mathematically speaking, and it woke up with his enormous work of translating everything, including things that the uh, Islamic mathematicians did not know much of, like uh, Papus's collection, for example. So, what Comandino tried was to become Greek. The question is, is there a substance to this, to Greekness? So, what is the alternative to Greekness? I think it is what the Greeks called barbarian, but not in their understanding. Their understanding was that you are barbarian if you don't speak Greek. Well, that's very superficial, I think. Whether some specifically Greek things, some things that they and only they came up with. And I think we can find two such things. One is the axiomatic method, in which a domain of thought is organized by singling out a few key pronouncements, and everything else is deduced. So the realization that theories are narratives on their own most clearly expressed in the field of mathematics, but not only. And the second characteristic is an emphasis on the importance of history. Sure, you might say, well, the Chinese and the Egyptians had their own histories, but their own histories were basically names of pharaohs or who the strong people were. Well, that's very different from what the Greeks did. Here we have a... Um, uh, historical recording of what happened in a meaningful narrative, not a, just a names and 
uh, won this battle and that's it. So, as I said, his, uh, what Comandino did was clearly thinking that this is something worth doing. This is a question of taste. It is impossible to say whether one is better than the other, whether to be Greek is better than to be barbarian. It's Um, so, the idea was that introducing this approach in education, Italian and by extension Western culture opted for this Greek approach. And it has had a, a significant effect on the later history. Now, Western culture, if there is anything that is under that name, has two origins. One is Athens, the other is Jer Jerusalem. Athens can form the basis of a cultural herit heritage because the Greek, Greek approach can be taught, and it has been taught, both in Greek times and in modern times. The position toward life and uh, the world originating in uh, Jerusalem cannot be taught. For as Krishnamurti emphasized, there is no right guru. There is only wrong guru, because nobody can teach you what you are. So the spectacular failure of teaching the ethos originating in Jerusalem was not a historical accident. It's something you can't do. And vice versa, you can have people like Francesco of Assisi, who, without knowing uh, Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic or Pali and never having heard of the Buddha, figured it out on his own against uh, his time, which contained no indication that that's the thing to do. Whereas in, in the Greek way, we don't have any example of a Pacheka Buddha, which is a Buddha who, out of his, himself, without having seen, without having experienced, uh, without having heard of uh, any kind of doctrine, would find out uh, the, the truth about life. In Greek, the Greek way, we don't have any such example. We have Ramanujan, for example, who was able to invent an enormous amount of mathematics. Not having paper, he wrote them down in notebooks, only the results, one after the other. And it took about 40 years of the best mathematicians to make sense of what he wrote and to prove it. We have no idea how, they, how he proved these things. He told us that he, the goddess Namagiri Thayar told him all these things. We have the example of the Japanese mathematicians who have these wooden tablets at the entrance of temples, the Sangaku problems which are very complicated geometry problems, but with no hint of a proof. They're all correct. We don't know how they found them. So independently, we haven't seen anyone coming up with the Greek approach out of themselves. It's something that you have to culturally have heard of. Pretty much like music. I mean, you can be Clara Haskell, and if you have no piano invented, you won't be able to play. Perhaps you will be if you don't have a teacher, but without a piano, surely not. And I think that the Greek heritage is like the piano. You can't invent it. So it's something that happily can, can be taught and need to be taught if it is to survive. Now you might say that I just made up these two origins, that they're kind of have nothing to do with Western civilization. 
It might be an accident, but perhaps not, that the only two university professors in all of Germany who refused in 1934 to swear the Hitler oath were Kurt von Fritz and Karl Barth. The first was a Greek classicist, and the second one was a Christian theologian. They both lost their university positions. So, the question is, isn't this all ancient history? I mean, what relevance can Comandino have today? I mean, he was in the business of humanism. Did we not graduate from humanism the way we graduated from elementary school? Didn't the age of enlightenment follow? And didn't we even graduate from that, like from middle school? Well, let's see what Kant said that enlightenment is. He says the enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed knowledge. Knowledge is unmündigkeit. Knowledge is the inability to use one's own understanding without another's guidance. This knowledge is self-imposed if the cause lies not in lack of understanding, but in indecision and lack of courage to use one's own mind without another's guidance. Dare to know. Have the courage to use your own understanding is therefore the motto of the Enlightenment. Laziness and cowardice are the reasons why such a large part of humanity gladly remain minors all their lives, long after nature has freed them from external guidance. They are the reasons why it is so easy for others to set themselves up as guardians. It is comfortable to be a minor. If I have a book that thinks for me, a pastor who acts as my conscience, a physician who prescribes my diet, and so on, then I have no need to exert myself. I have no need to think if I can only pay. Others will take care of that disagreeable business for me. Well, I leave it to you to think if we have graduated from this. Can a culture who has adopted Greekness uh, fall back into barbaric thought, or does it live on on automatic pilot? You don't need to do anything for it. Or is it, need, or is it something that needs to be continually fought over? Because the lure of a barbarian lifestyle is very strong. I mean, you, you, you don't have to have the weight of, uh, of history on you because you don't think historically. Everything happens now. All your thoughts are valid because they come from you and what better uh, origin for them to be true. You don't need to go through these uh, painful questioning of things and figuring out what the axioms of your thought are and all of these things. After all, the hero of this Greek thought, which is Socrates, knew only that he didn't know anything. So it's a very poor um, hero for the ego who tries to know things and understand things. So, perhaps staying Greek is an everyday struggle, as Patricia boisson schnorokian once told me. She um, is a, a specialist in medieval Armenian and has translated a lot of medieval Armenian texts, including two um, histories of Armenia from medieval times. And she told me, l'Arménité, c'est un combat de tous les jours. Um, for her, the combat was that she had to raise uh, three kids uh, with Armenian as a language in uh, a suburb of Paris, which is uh, un combat de tous les jours. So, we're perhaps too Faulknerian. We think that the past is never dead. It's not even past. But if we look, for example, at what Dostoevsky wrote in 1880, 
But God will save his people, for Russia is great in her humility. Smyrenia is a bit more than humility. Well, about 13, 37 years later, this was lost. There is no, the past was completely dead. So the idea that somebody does something once for you and then you can just go to sleep, because Comandino was then and we're doing fine, I think is a major mistake. There's also a mistake, and I've noticed this when I talk about the Greeks, that one thinks that one is smarter than them because, well, we know so many more things and we have so many more gadgets. Well, um, Littlewood once told Hardy that the Greek mathematicians are not clever schoolboys or scholarship candidates, but fellows of another college. So, thinking of them as, uh, as some kind of primitives in their mathematics, as some kind of thing that you graduate from, is a major mistake. So translating the elements is one first way to enter the Greek world. Here you see a translation from the seventh century. The manuscript is from the 12th century in Armenian. Here you see Comandinos, 1572, Latin translation. And uh, as I said, in, in school mathematics, this is not encountered anymore for various reasons. One is that one should have a happy childhood, and uh, certainly going through all this is not very happy. And uh, what has it been replaced by? Since we don't have geometry, well, it's a lot of what I would call Babylonian mathematics. The Babylonians were great at computations and numbers. The Greeks were very bad at these things. Um, there's no mystery left in mathematics at all. Just the part that a computer does better than a human is all that's left. What's the purpose of this? I mean, I myself have never used mathematics in real life. The idea is that these people will. Perhaps they will have lives where they use them. I didn't. Um, what is it to increase perhaps the shame of not being a thing, which Günther Anders sees in his Antiquität der Menschheit, this mention of 1956, where he sees a second level of alienation, that on which man has recognized the superiority of things, brings himself in conformity with them, approves of his own having become a thing, respectively condemns his not having become a thing as a shortcoming. So my point is that if one were to teach geometry, because geometry cannot be done by machines, one would restore the dignity of being human and of having creativity. What we're teaching is just teaching that we're worse than our machines. It's part of idolatry. Now the question is, is geometry not disappearing? Did it did not disappear because it had exhausted what it had to say, didn't we become too good at it, and what's the point in doing more of that? Well, no, not quite. Euclidean geometry has something that is called similarity. You can have a small triangle and a big triangle. Something you see when you go to a copier machine and you put some percentages there to shrink it or to magnify it. You expect the shrink, the shrink thing or the magnified thing to be the exactly same thing, only to a smaller scale. Well, this is a particular quality of Euclidean geometry. However, in 1831, Janos Bojoy had defined something called absolute geometry, which is a geometry true in Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry where certain assumptions of Euclid, the parallel postulate, and also what follows from it, things like the existence of a rectangle, are not assumed. So it's a core 
geometry that is agnostic regarding the existence of similar triangles. So no similarity is allowed, which means there's no room for computations in it. Discovering truth in absolute geometry is extraordinarily strenuous. However, most things are true there. So, when one does geometry in this way, one obviously is a poet also in the sense of the saying from Josef Brodsky, that a poet writes to please his predecessors, not his contemporaries. And how does one speak to the ancestors is what Jorge Teller tells us. Para hablar con los muertos hay que elegir palabras que ellos reconozcan tan fácilmente como sus manos reconocían el pelaje de sus perros en la oscuridad. So in order to talk with the dead, you have to choose words that they recognize as easily as their hands recognize the fur of their dogs in the dark. So whenever I wrote things that I thought would interest my predecessors and they were dead, mostly Friedrich Bachmann and other uh, people who were interested in this pure geometry, I wrote in German, but uh, the last one was in 2004 because afterwards nobody would accept a paper in German, so now I can no longer follow this. Let's look at examples of things that ought to be true without these Euclidean assumptions. So, following the example of his mentor Federico Enriquez, whom he met as an engineering student at the University of Bologna, Oscar Chisini was actively involved in the teaching of mathematics at the secondary school level. He held the position of editorial secretary of Il Periodico di Matematiche in 1921, when Enriquez became his mani uh, its mani managing editor, and after Enriquez's death, death, Chisini held the managing editorship for the rest of his life. In 1925, another mathematician with an interest in elementary mathematics, Alessandro Padoa, who is famous in logic, published a note in the Periodico in which he proved by using elementary inequalities that of all triangles with a given parameter, the equilateral triangle has the greatest radius of the circumscribed circle. In a paper appearing right after Padoa's paper, Chisini proved, provided a purely geometric proof of the validity of the theorem in plain Euclidean geometry over real numbers, rephrased as, of all triangles inscribed in a given circle, the equilateral triangle has the greatest parameter. In 2007, after thinking about this problem for about three years, I could show that it is true in absolute geometry. So, first of all, there's a lot of things you have to do before showing this. First of all, there has to be an angle of 120 degrees in absolute geometry so that there is a, an equilateral triangle inscribed in your circle. That's not an easy thing to do. I happened to do this in 1998. So let's look at what it says here. So you have here a, a uh, circle. And of all the triangles that you can inscribe in this, so pick any three points on the circumference, you get a triangle. Well, which one has the biggest parameter? Well, the equilateral one, and you would think this has nothing to do with the Euclidean nature. This has to be a very general thing. All you should be able to do is you should be able to put these three sides of your triangle 
back to back to form the so-called parameter and to be able to compare them. Well, that's pretty much what absolute geometry does. It allows you to do that. So, to me, the proof in Euclidean geometry is a good first step. When you have no other proof, it's fine. But in time, you should always look for the, hot, the difficult proof, the one in absolute geometry. Well, why is that? But suppose you prove something, a certain property that you think are of humans, and you use for that property the fact that humans have flat nails. And it's essential in your proof of that particular property that humans have. It turns out that the property is common to all mammals. How ridiculous would your proof be then when you're using a particular flat nail story for this property that is true of you know, cats, dogs, and others who have no flat nails. That's exactly the same story here. When you have a proof in Euclidean geometry that is fundamentally Euclidean, you have masked, you have obscured the true reasons why that thing is true. So you, you have a hope that it's going to work, but until you know how it works, you don't know the true reasons for that. You have the wrong reasons. You have the flat nail reasons for it. Now, Comandino has a work on, on centers of gravity. And I'd like to show that that is as relevant today as it was then. So, if we think of a system of material points, so think of points, and every point has some mass attached to it. And you can join two such systems and uh, create a bigger system. Well, that's what that says. And to any such system of points, you call a, a center of gravity something that satisfies a few conditions. The center of gravity of just one point with a certain mass is just the, itself. That's clear, right? That's what you want the center of gravity to do. If you have two points, A and B, each having the same mass, then the center of gravity should be in the middle, and you don't say what the mass should be there. You expect, because you have this Euclidean thing, that it should be the sum of the masses. I'm not asking for that whatever mass, but just asking that it be in the middle. Now, if I have two points, and whatever mass here and whatever mass there, then the center should be on this line. That's a reasonable thing, right? You expect the center of gravity to be on that line. The next one is that if I have two systems, then I can do always the center of gravity of one system, of another one, and then do the center of gravity of what I get. That's the fourth condition. There's an additional axiom, additional condition that you may ask, which is no longer absolute, which is Eucle of Euclidean nature. It says that the center of mass should not depend the, the mass associated in the center of mass should not depend on the masses of the two objects. So I have an A with a mass M, a B with a mass B. And there is somewhere a center of mass of this system. There is a certain amount, K said, associated to it. Now I have two other points. They may be at a much bigger distance. And I'm saying in the center of mass, which is wherever it wants to be, there should be exactly the same amount. So the amount doesn't depend on the distance. This is not true in the non-Euclidean center of masses. Center of gravity that satisfies the fifth axiom as well will be called strong. So 
if I assume that I have only three points, that, 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 that the centers of mass exist for systems of two or three points, and the three points should have the same mass attached to them, then I get nothing. I get no Euclidianity. Yeah? That this is so was proved by Johannes Jelpslev, a Danish mathematician in 1929. Why? Well, he showed that the medians of a triangle are concurrent in absolute geometry, in a very weak, actually, absolute geometry. So, if we allow four points of equal weight, the points can be also not different all, then the existence of a strong center of gravity implies Euclidianity. Maria Teresa Calapso, a mathematician from Messina, has shown this in 1971. She showed the following thing. If you have the picture that you see there, where M is the midpoint of OA, N is the midpoint of OB, C is the midpoint of AB, then, and P is the midpoint of MN. If you have this, this is a given, right? So given the points O, M, A, B, C, N, P, with M midpoint of O, A, N midpoint of O, B, and C midpoint of A, C, and P midpoint of M, N, then O, P, and C should be collinear. That's enough to imply the Euclidean nature of the metric. In other words, there exists a rectangle in this case. What does it have to do with weights? Well, think of, of two systems, A and B. A is made of O and A. In both is the same weight, mu. And B is the system made of O and B. In O and B, it's the same weight. Now bring the two systems together. You will have now twice 2m in O. You have 2 mu in O. Two, well, you'll have a mu in A and a mu in B. And if there is a center of gravity for this system, then the things are happening like in Calapso's axiom. Why is that? Well, think of the center of gravity of O and A. It should be at M. Of O and B, it should be at N. Now, in M and N, there are the same weights, because we've said that axiom 5 holds. It doesn't matter how far you are. If you have the same weights there, it's the same weight there. So, the center of gravity of M and N is at the middle point, so at P. Okay, so we computed the center of gravity of OAC, OAB, in a certain way. Now let's compute it in another way. First compute the center of gravity of AB, that's C. So now OC has the center of gravity somewhere on the line, and we're done. So it means that the P, which has to be the center of gravity of the system, is on the line. Pierre Varignon's theorem also implies Euclidianity. Pierre Varignon's theorem just says that the two things that you see there intersect in the midpoint. That's again something that implies Euclidianity. And it has again that midpoint there that you see, the middle of everything, would be the center of gravity of this system. I don't have time for this, so... Here is another thing where um, the center of gravity can be said to be essential in proving that a space pentagon that has all sides and all diagonals congruent must be flat. This is important for chemists. And you can show it with hardly any axiom except for the assumption that any system of five points has a center of gravity. Now, 
to end this talk is Comandino's own theorem. What does he say? He looks at the center of gravity of a tetrahedron. So you have po four points in space, and he says, you compute the center of this by doing the medians of this thing. Well, what are the medians? Let me show you his picture. Okay? So you join a vertex of the tetrahedron with a center of gravity of the opposite face. There are four such. His theorem says that these four meet. Um, the simplest proof is one that uses Menelaus' theorem and can be done in one line. Now, there are several axiom systems for a very bare bones absolute geometry in which all you have is symmetry in planes. This should be true there. Well, why? Well, I have several reasons why. But nobody has shown it is. So we don't have the right setup for proving this theorem that goes back to the 16th century. Um, so it is an open problem to show that Comandino's theorem requires just a very bare bones absolute geometry of three-dimensional space. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan, for your wonderful uh, lecture. I think that we can begin with the second uh, lesson magistralis. Uh, I thank uh, in advance uh, Vincenzo. So thank you very much, and, 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 and well, most of all, thank you for the medal at the University of Urbino and the friends and colleagues here. It was really a honor and a pleasure, and I'm really moved by this hour. I'm, I'm really, really happy. I was here, as Vincenzo was saying, uh, uh, for a, a, a month in, in 2017, and I must say, I mean, this was really one of the most exciting months and, and most pleasant months of my academic uh, life, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here again. And, and I, I, I'm happy that you are still managing to have this incredible uh, 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 meeting between scientists, mathematicians, philosophers, historians, which is really a richness of the university. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you have uh, established this medal uh, on, uh, uh, dedicated to, to Guido Baldo for young uh, scholars. I mean, I, I'm a bit borderline, but, but uh, uh, I, I think this is really important for the community uh, to have uh, an important award for history and philosophy of science and mathematics uh, for young scholars as well. And I am also happy that it is dedicated to Guido Baldo and I hope that this would move things a bit 
uh, in order to study more uh, uh, Dalmonte, who would, in fact, uh, very much deserve a, a better history and, and, uh, and a better consideration by, by, by historians. So I, I will give a talk on, on, on uh, uh, history of mathematics, and I will say something about uh, uh, diagrams in, in, in mathematics and, uh, and in geometry. Diagrams, that is to say, uh, figures, pictures that you find in, in geometrical books, triangles, squares, and, uh, and things like that. There is a, a flourishing literature, in fact, in the study of diagrams in mathematics, in the last decades. Uh, this mostly concern uh, um, uh, uh, cognitive scientists, philosophers of mathematics, and of course people working in, in computer science attempting to understand how diagrams and images and drawings are used in geometry in order to draw uh, 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 mathematical conclusions. What is still lacking, I think, is a bit of history of this phenomenon. That is to say, all these studies, which are very important on diagrammatic reasoning and visual thinking in mathematics, are still considering geometry mostly as one thing uh, with no uh, 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 historical development. And I think that here, uh, we as historians of mathematics should still uh, 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 say something, and, and that the history of diagrammatic and visual uh, uh, thinking in mathematics is, uh, is really important. And so I will try to give you some, some hints of this uh, vast territory, which is very much to be explored yet. Uh, and I will begin by, by making reference to something that Ansel said, that is to say, uh, uh, the connection between geometry and the conception of space, which is my main topic of research since many uh, uh, years. That is, uh, uh, now uh, we are all used, in fact, we have heard Victor's talk as well, to consider geometry as somehow connected to the notion of space and to consider geometry as the science of space, but this was not the case for many, many centuries. In fact, uh, uh, if you take uh, 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 ancient geometry and you look at uh, 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 Euclid or, or medieval geometry or or Renaissance geometry, you will find that no one among those geometers or philosophers of geometry mentions space at all. I mean, uh, classical geometry was a geometry of triangles, of circles, of squares, of conic sections. That is, individual figures of which we want to understand the properties and, and, and the features. But they were not conceived as embedded in any kind of space, and much less uh, uh, spatial properties or space itself was considered to be an object of geometrical investigation. And uh, the transformation of geometry from this kind of science of figures, of individual figures, into a science of space happened, in fact, very late. And I. I think I found, in fact, that the first person who ever claimed that was a philosopher, a Neoplatonic philosopher, uh, a more or less contemporary of Comandino and Guido Baldo. Uh, this Francesco Patrizzi da Caruso, who lived here in, in Ferrara, not far from here, and, and, uh, and Patrizzi uh, uh, wrote two important books on the metaphysics of space called De Spazio, and then he added a third book called Della Nuova Geometria, written in Italian. And in this book, for the first time, he stated, as you see, le matematiche tutte principali e subalterne, ne si astraggono dalle cose naturali, which would be Aristotle, of course, ne sono nella fantasia, which would be the Neoplatonic tradition of Proclus and the other, ne nella dianea, Plato, Ma lo spazio è generale lo subietto, that is, space is their, is their proper subject. And this is, I, I think, that I know, the first statement in, in which someone say that space has something to do with geometry, and it is, in fact, the object of geometrical investigation. 
in the following centuries, that is in the 17th century and then in the 18th century, uh, this idea by Patrici became widespread and, and more and more philosophers and mathematicians began to accept the idea that uh, uh, geometry is in fact the science of space. But, but it, it came to general acceptance only in the 19th century. So this is the big background, that is the history of the notion of space intertwined with the notion of geometry. And, and I would say that this very general history offers a very important framework to understand the development of diagrammatic reasoning and visual reasoning, something that apparently has not much to do with this, but that, in, in fact, it is, I would try to show, deeply connected with this philosophical development. Uh, uh, so, let, let's, let's begin to talk about diagrams and, and, uh, and pictures in, in geometrical books. Uh, uh, geometrical texts have this kind of diagrams since the beginning. You, you have here uh, uh, one of the most ancient papyri on, on, on geometry containing a, a section of the elements of Euclid, and you see there are, there are diagrams here, there are pictures here. You have some uh, manuscripts uh, 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 in Greek with the elements of Euclid. You have uh, some very nice medieval editions of, of uh, the element with colorful diagrams and, and, and beautiful drawings. You have some others here, very nice codes. And, and you see here again, these are circles and triangles as in, in Euclidean tradition. You have mathematicians that, of course, work with diagrams in their private notes. And this is Comandino from, from a manuscript from, from, from the library here in Urbino. And you have, with the invention of the press, printed diagrams and, and very complex diagrams which began to be printed in, in, the, in the 15th and then in the 16th century. And this is an important part of the story, and it is also an important part of the story of Comandino himself, because of course to do this kind of uh, 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 printing, one needs to mobilize a, a lot of people doing uh, uh, this drawing for the print. Uh, uh, then you have any kind of diagrams in the early modern age, diagrams which have no letters but rather names. You have diagrams in black and white in order to stress different uh, uh, parts of the figure. You have diagrams uh, in, uh, in three dimension, as you see there in, uh, on the right, in order to describe three-dimensional figures. But you also have books with uh, uh, pieces of paper that can be uh, 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 constructed in order to touch and see what 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 uh, uh, three-dimensional figures are, and then you have diagrams which are colorful and can be uh, employed, as you see in the demonstration itself, just comparing parts of the drawing from 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 uh, from the diagram itself. And here we have reached the 19th century. So what I would like to say is that you have historically an enormous variety of diagrams evolving from, from the first uh, 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 manuscripts or, uh, or papyri on Euclid to uh, 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 con contemporary times. And, and of course, one may use these diagrams for, for a lot of different uh, 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 users. And uh, what I'm stressing is that we still need a history of this uh, 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 changing phenomenon. On the one hand, it is quite understandable that we do not do a history of that. Because if you take the oldest uh, 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 diagram here and then you take Hilbert's diagrams from the Grundlagen in, 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 in uh, uh, 1899, you see that, I mean, not much seemed to have changed after all from the first to the second book. Uh, I, and so I think that many philosophers of mathematics and, uh, and philosophers of science in general just draw the conclusion that more or less this was a kind of stable practice throughout uh, 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 centuries. Well, we know on the other hand that this was not uh, uh, the case because as we all know one of the most important features of Hilbert's approach to geometry is that 
you do not really need the diagrams for your own demonstrations. That is, in principle, you could read or you should be able to read the Grundlagen der Geometrie without pictures and try to understand what is, what is going on there. Because you have uh, definitions enough, axioms enough in order to uh, uh, follow the proof without looking at uh, uh, the diagrams themselves. And this is not the case of Euclid. This is not a, neither a, 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 the case of Euclid nor the case of many, many other treatises of uh, ancient, medieval, Renaissance and early modern geometry. In, in these works, you rely on diagrams in order to make inferences. And this is the, the epistemic value of diagrams. It is why you can do things with diagrams and you can prove things with diagrams in classical geometry. So at least there has been this important change. Let's see uh, this a bit uh, uh, closer. Let's take the most classical proposition of the elements. This is the first proposition of the elements where Euclid teaches on, on how, how to draw an equilateral triangle on a, on a given segment. This a proposition has been commented over and over throughout the centuries because it became a kind of paradigm of a geometrical proof. And the most important thing uh, and, and, and striking thing of, of this proof is that Euclid employs in order to carry out this proof, a lot of principles and a lot of statements. That is, you have that uh, uh, segment there, then Euclid employs an explicit postulate allowing you to draw circles from any center and any radius, and, and through that he can draw the circle. Then he uses this postulate again, and so he can draw the other circle. Then he uses another postulate, postulate one, allowing to draw a line from any point to any other point, to draw that, that line here. Then he uses again postulate one. Then he uses a definition of the circle, saying that uh, 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 the radii of a circle are all equal <laughs> to one another, and in this way he establishes that in the figure that he has constructed you have two equalities, AB is equal to AC and, and AB is equal to BC, and then he goes further and uses Another principle yet, a common notion one, saying that things which are equal to the same things are also equal to one another, and he concludes with the third equality, and then he can say that ABC is an equilateral triangle. So you see, in order to perform this absolutely trivial construction, he uses two postulates, one common notion, one definition, and it is very explicit that everything is, is going through this kind of, of, of uh, explicit principles. Yet, as you know, uh, modern mathematicians had something to say about this proof, and in particular, they say that Euclid has no explicit principles in order to say that when you draw these two circles, one centered in A and the other centered in B, they will actually meet in a given point C. Perhaps the circles are not continuous enough and there is some gap. Perhaps they meet, but they do not meet in a point, but in a line. Perhaps they, they are apart, because if you are imagining not to look at the diagram, it might be that these two circles are just uh, too distant from one another in order to intersect. So what, what Euclid is doing here is clearly relying on the diagram and the image on the picture in order to draw the conclusion that these two circles have, in fact, a point of intersection in C. That is, when you draw them, they have to intersect. When, when you actually perform the construction and you look at the diagram, you see that they cannot but intersect in point C. Now, this kind of practices we call generally now diagrammatic inferences. That is, there are inferences that are not drawn by explicit propositional principles, but rather from looking at the picture and the diagram. So what is happening in, 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 uh, in uh, classical geometry is that you have a kind of interplay between a propositional part of the proof and uh, a diagrammatic or visual part of the proof, which gives you some further information that you 
make use of in the, in the, in the proof as, as such. And modern mathematicians, that is Hilbert, criticized this kind of diagrammatic inferences, saying that, uh, I mean, abiding to a completely different ideal of proof as something that should not use this kind of visual hints in order to prove things, but should be entirely propositional or symbolic, but, 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 but in any case, entirely propositional. Now, some philosophers of mathematics nowadays have attempted to show how did it happen that notwithstanding the many criticisms that modern mathematicians have raised against the use of diagrammatic inferences in classical geometry, you do not normally find any mistake in classical geometry. That is, uh, demonstration in classical geometry do rely on diagrams. Modern mathematicians tell you beware of diagrams because if you do inferences just looking at the figure, you may go wrong. But nevertheless, the classical texts of mathematics do not have any serious hindrance in looking at the diagrams. And in particular, uh, Kenneth Manders from Pittsburgh has uh, 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 advanced a, a, very, a very popular uh, uh, and important theory in, in the 90s, according to which it is useful to distinguish different properties of geometrical figures and uh, stressing that some properties can in fact be inferred from diagrams and, and drawings and pictures, and, so, um, and some other properties cannot. And that Greek geometers and medieval and Renaissance geometers were in fact following this kind of, distinct, uh, of distinction between things that can actually be proven from diagrams and things that cannot. So for instance, when you take a Pythagoras theorem, you cannot infer just from the diagram that the big square is equal to, to the sum of the two other squares. It is not valid to look at, at the diagram or even to measure the diagram and say, see, this is true, so, so Pythagoras' theorem is true. These are what Ken Manders call exact properties. That is to say, these are properties that concern measurement. And everything that concerns measurements, you cannot infer this kind of properties just looking at the picture because they, they concern exactness and, 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 uh, and, uh, and measuring things. On the other hand, if I draw by hand the diagrams of, of Euclid 1-1, how, I mean, no matter how badly I draw the circles, I will see that they do overlap and intersect in, in point C. So there are some other properties like this that are really unaffected from the fact that I am working with symbols and Im imperfect diagrams rather than uh, uh, real geometrical figures. So, so, so what Manders is saying is a kind of revival of uh, uh, Poincaré's famous definition of geometry as reasoning well from badly drawn figures. That is, you can do that. And, and uh, so the claim is that even though ancient geometers, of course, or, or epistemologists did not spell out this distinction, nonetheless, there is a constant practice according to which all the properties concerning measure are always propositionally inferred and all, of, and all the properties concerning this kind of relative position of things that are unaffected by small modifications of the diagrams, they are diagrammatically uh, uh, inferred. In fact, uh, this point of view of Kenneth Manders is, is, works quite well from a historical perspective. That is, if, if, if we look actually at, at what Euclid, Apollonius, Archimedes, but then also Arabic mathematicians in the Middle Ages or Renaissance mathematicians in, the, in, the, in, in Italy or in France were doing in the 16th century, for instance, you see that they follow quite, uh, 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 quite well this, this path. 
And, uh, and of course, I have shown the case of Euclid 1-1 with the intersection of the circles, but there are many, many other properties that are diagrammatically inferred, uh, 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 such as, for instance, order properties and, and so on, that Euclid did not axiomatize, but, also, but always uh, 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 see in the diagram. Now, at some point, though, we have seen mathematicians began to be suspicion, uh, uh, suspicious about uh, uh, diagrammatic inferences. So the question for us as historians is, uh, uh, why did it happen? That is, why a, a practice of mathematics that was going so well with diagrammatic inferences at some point transformed, as an ideal at least, into something entirely propositional, entirely logical, if you want. And uh, the standard answer here is that it depends on a kind of crisis of intuition in the 19th century. That is, in the 19th century, mathematics became too abstract and too remote from, from, uh, from intuition that you could not rely anymore on diagrams. In non-Euclidean geometry, you cannot always rely on what you are seeing. In abstract algebra, of course not. In, in, in set theory, when you deal with infinity, much less. In complex analysis, who knows, and, and so on. And, 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 and for this reason, 19th century mathematicians began to develop purely propositional technique in order to deal with geometry. And this was, was the beginning of what Hilbert and other in the, in the 20th century began to uh, uh, say. Now, I would not deny all of this, of course, but if you look at the historical text, this doesn't work really well. And uh, this is, a, I think, an important point. That is to say, Doing mathematics without diagrams and without diagrammatic inferences began much earlier than the 19th century, much earlier than the discovery of abstract algebra or non-Euclidean geometry or, or anything like that. It began, in fact, in the, in the early modern age. In the early modern age, you have several mathematicians and several epistemologists that began to question the fitness of diagrams to provide rigorous demonstration in geometry. You have people like Pietro Catena, who uh, involved in the question of the Certitudine Mathematicarum, uh, said that, that diagrams are the hocus pocus of mathematicians, just a trick. You have uh, John Wallace, uh, who in, in, in attempting to prove the parallel postulate has long paragraphs against the possibility of drawing inference, just looking at the figure. Then you have for instance, uh, 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 well, uh, uh, there is a, an important book on, on perspective written by Guido Baldo Dal Monte. You know, the Perspectiva Libris Sex. Now, this Perspectiva Libris Sex by Guido Baldo are full of pictures, are, are full of images, but they are somehow reused. In, in, the, in, in 1715 by, by a British mathematician called Brooke Taylor, who, who wrote this, this, this uh, 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 linear perspective, uh, which draws a lot on the work of, uh, on the mathematical work of, of, of his predecessors and Guidobaldo himself. And this is an entire book on perspective without figures, without diagrams. That is, you have a mathematical treatment of something that should be of use for painters or artists that just has no images whatsoever. This was a, a very strange book, and, and it was also an editorial flop. No one bought it, and, 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 uh, and at some point, uh, 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 Brooke Taylor wrote a second edition with a lot of pictures, that's sold very well, and, but, but, but in the preface, he said, I have to apologize with the reader in, because I had to put images in there, even though the mathematical treatment would not need any of those. So, so you see that something was happening uh, 
between, let's say, Guidobaldo's purely mathematical treatment of perspective in 1700 and what Brooke Taylor was doing a century later. You see something similar also in different disciplines. Uh, uh, once again, if you take the, the, uh, 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 the treatise on mechanics by Guidobaldo, uh, uh, this is full of pictures, and, and Bertoloni Meli has written a wonderful paper uh, showing that many of the theorems on mechanics proved by Guidobaldo are in fact proven by inspecting the diagram, the figure. That is, there is no real articulation of the proof, it is just look here, you will see that this is true. And many of these theorems were used later on by Lagrange, who quotes Guidobaldo, in fact, in his Mechanique Analytique, and this Mechanique Analytique, of, 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 of course, it is very famous to be a book on mechanics without figures and without images. So once again, something happened in the course of the 17th century or in the 18th century that brought a radical shift on what counts as a good demonstration in mathematics, in mechanics, in geometry, on the one hand with diagrams, on the other hand without uh, uh, diagrams. So for instance, take our, our proof of, of, of Euclid 1.1. Uh, uh, you find normally in, in histories of mathematics that the one who detected the fact that there is a gap in the proof of Euclid and that Euclid had to provide some principle for the intersection of the circles there uh, was Maurice Pasch in 1882. But in fact, this is not the case. For this kind of gap in Euclid was detected much, much earlier. In fact, it was detected by, by this Ronce Fine or Ronce Finet in 1532, who said that that proof had a gap, and he inserted a, a sixth postulate in the elements of Euclid, saying that if a straight or curved line is drawn from a point which is within a figure to another point in the same plane which is outside of the figure, it will intersect the sides of the boundaries of the figures. Through these purely propositional axioms, you can, in fact, gave, give a demonstration of Euclid 1.1 that can show that there is a point of intersection in, in C, something that was not done by Euclid. So Fien did not need to rely on the diagram in order to draw this kind of inference. And, and this axiom by Fien was uh, extended by, by a Spanish scholar, uh, uh, de Monzon, who used it, then by a French scholar, Claude Richard, who had several axioms uh, to this effect, that is to ground a theory of intersection without diagrams. Claude Richard, by the way, has this addition of the elements of Euclid, but he also has a kind of commentary on the elements of Euclid, which has remained in, 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 in manuscript form, and, and you can find in the, in, the, in the library of Madrid. And this passage here is Richard proof of Euclid 1.1. You see that there are no pictures in the manuscripts. That is, Richard went on with a completely only propositional uh, 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 reasoning that uh, uh, made without any, 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 any diagram there. And then you have further and, and further others employing this kind of axioms in the uh, uh, 17th century. Wallis, Pascal, Borelli, Schott, Robert Wall, and of course Leibniz who uh, 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 wrote a, a, a lot of important papers, also from the methodological point of view, saying that you should not use diagrams in, in geometry. So, you have this important change that many, many mathematicians in the, in the, in the, in the 17th century, in the 16th already, but especially in the 17th century, began to regard the diagrammatic inferences as not valid, not rigorous. And of course, here we have an important historical phenomenon to explain, because this could not be due to any too abstract mathematics. 
There were no non Euclidean geometry here, no complex analysis, nothing. I mean, this was just classical Euclidean geometry. And, and, but, but nonetheless, there was a, an important change in the foundations of geometry and an important change in the ideal of proof of geometry. And so I, I think here we can reconnect the story about space that I uh, 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 mentioned at, uh, at the beginning of the talk. Because I, at, at some point, uh, 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 I, I just asked the question of which, which mathematicians uh, 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 attempted for the first time to write an entire treatise on geometry without diagrams, without figures. Uh, uh, we have seen that there are several mathematicians who uh, accepted one or, I mean, who added one or the other axioms and, and, and therefore made non-diagrammatic, transformed some propositions into non-diagrammatic uh, uh, proofs. But, but who is the first who embraced this as a kind of research program and with the idea of writing an entire book without diagrams in geometry. And uh, I mean, I went back and back, and with my great surprise, it was again Patrice's Nuova Geometria. This is something that I did not expect, frankly. I mean, if you read Patrice della Nuova Geometria, you find that he, all, he only has propositional proofs and, and, and uh, no use whatsoever of diagrams, and this is explicit in the preface of the book. He doesn't want to use this kind of diagrams. Patrice's proofs are very bad, I must say. That is, if you read them, they are kind of uh, uh, logical inferences which are very abstract and that do not really provide any interesting mathematical or geometrical content to what is attempting to prove. So we can say, in a sense, that what uh, uh, Patrizzi was attempting to do was not only impossible from a logical point of view, but also full of mistakes from his part. That is, he managed to prove the entire first book of the elements of Euclid without diagrams just because he, he, he assumed things uh, 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 without noticing and, and made a lot of paralogies and other mistakes. Leibniz himself, who was in the same uh, epistemological program of proving the whole of the elements of Euclid without diagrams, read Patrice's book, uh, and he commented that the preface is wonderful, that is, the program is wonderful, but the, the les dedans fait pitié, the interior of the book of, of Patrice is just a, a, a waste of time, because Patrice was not able to do what he was uh, set uh, to do, that is to say, to do geometry uh, 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 without uh, uh, diagrams. But at this point, you see, the fact that the same person that I mentioned before as the first philosophers who claimed that geometry is the science of space is also the first philosophers, the first geometer that said that we should do geometry without the consideration of diagrams. It is an important clue. I mean, it is, it is something that should speak a lot about the connection between philosophy of space and the epistemology of diagrams. And what I think that happens is that this allows us to answer to the question, uh, how did change mathematics how did mathematics change in, in, the, in, the, in the early modern age so that the ideal of proof was changed into something purely propositional? Now, let's go back to the distinction that Ken Manders uh, uh, drew between properties of the figures that can be uh, 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 proven propositionally, that is about magnitudes, about measure, and uh, properties that can only be uh, uh, proven by looking at the diagram itself. Now, if we consider which was considered to be the object of geometry before 
the early modern age. That is, geometry was about circles, squares, triangles, conic sections. All these figures were generally called by Greek mathematicians and philosophers magnitudes, that is, uh, 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 megete. And this immediately shows that the main aim of classical geometry was in fact to measure things. And this is a, a big part, of course, of Archimedes and the elements of Euclid, that is to give exact measurement of different figures. And if you think that the main object of geometry are magnitudes, then it is clear why in the propositional part of the proof, when you are explicit, when you, as mathematicians, write down step by step what are you doing, you are dealing with magnitudes, you are dealing with measurements, you are dealing with this kind of things. That is, you are thinking that geometry is about magnitudes and you describe everything that happens with these magnitudes in your deductive system. On the other hand, you do not have the idea that space is an object of geometrical investigation. Therefore, properties such as uh, to be on the right or on the left on that line, beyond the circle or inside the circle, in between these or that, or to overlap, or, or things like that, or, or, or being continuous, are not properties that you are considering explicitly in your, dis in, in your demonstration. You are, you are not doing your demonstration uh, uh, thematizing this kind of properties. You deal with magnitudes, and then you look at the diagram in order to draw these other, these other properties. So the properties that Kenneth Manders called the non-exact properties, I think that from a, from a historical point of view, it is useful to call them spatial properties. They are properties concerning spatial relations, being here, there, beyond, uh, uh, in a certain order, continuous width, etc. And so the idea is that classical geometry only concerned magnitudes and uh, diagrammatic inferences concern spatial properties. What happened in the early modern age is that space began to be taken and thematized as the object of geometrical investigation. Now you are investigating not magnitudes, but space and spatial properties and spatial figures. And at that point, you begin to put in propositional form things about space. That is, you began to write down what happens uh, when, when a point is on one side or the other side of a segment or, or inside or outside of a circle or when two circles do intersect or do not intersect. That is, you are pointing your attention, your, your, your propositional attention to this phenomena here. And so you find, for instance, that uh, uh, in Pascal, the, the, the introduction to geometry by Pascal begins by saying the object of pure geometry is space. So you find a very important statement there. And then just a few lines later, a circumference passing through a point inside of a circle and a point outside it, in, inter, it intersects the circumference of the circle at exactly two points. This is a, a new axiom, of course, concerning space. And, and the connection is, is, is quite explicit in this kind of axioms. Uh, uh, uh. So what I would like to say is that this transformation of geometry from a science of figures into a science of space uh, let, uh, 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 let, led geometricians to thematize spatial properties. They were therefore expressed propositionally in proof and in axioms, of course, because at, at that point you need axioms as well. And uh, geometrical diagrams were slowly abandoned as the uh, 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 
as a viable way to do geometrical investigation. And in fact, Patrizzi and then Leibniz, who are probably the two most important figures in the early modern age, thematizing space as the object of geometry and being not just mathematicians, but also philosophers and epistemologists, saw this very well and, and explicitly stated geometry is about space, geometry should be done without diagrams at all. And at that point, however, you get a kind of reversal of the classical narrative according to which geometry was de-diagramized in the, in the 19th century. It is not that in the 19th century there were new necessities for mathematics, that is, non-Euclidean geometry, etc., that forced you to abandon diagrammatic uh, uh, inferences. We can see the thing on the other way around. It is, since from the 16th century or the 17th century, mathematicians were trained more and more to do geometry, Euclidean geometry, perfectly intuitable geometry, without intuition, that is to say, without looking at the diagrams, because they were more and more uh, uh, pursuing a program in geometry according to which the, the ideal of demonstration was purely propositional, that at some point in the, in the 19th century, one could invent non-Euclidean geometry and say, do not look at the diagrams of everything, just, just follow your reasoning and you will find this kind of things, even if your senses say you something different. And, and, and uh, it is that kind of training and, and that kind of transformation that produced the 19th century uh, uh, 19th, uh, 19th century revolution as a kind of, of, of uh, 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 consequence. I can perhaps just, just uh, 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 say a little bit more. That is to say that it is important to understand also that a diagram is a, is a kind of intentional object. That is to say, what you are doing with a diagram is what really matters, not the figure on paper. And what happens often in the early modern age is that you still find diagrams in mathematical textbooks, even though these diagrams are not used in the demonstration itself. That is, you can follow the demonstration without looking to the diagrams, but nevertheless, the author puts the diagram there. Because, of course, diagrams may have a lot of different uses, and we have seen Hilbert himself put diagrams in the Grundlagen der Geometrie, because this is easier to follow the demonstration. It has a didactic value, uh, an epistemic value, which is not in the proof, but it is nonetheless in the, in the, in the comprehension of what is going on there. So in Patrice's book, for instance, you do find diagrams. You find that kind of diagrams have no letters. They are not referred in the proof. They are just put there in order to uh, 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 make you uh, uh, understand what is going in the propositional part of the proof. And, and Umberto Eco in the Trattato di Semiotica Generale uh, 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 says that there is a, 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 common, a common thing in, in semiotics that some signs are first used as icons in order to draw conclusions, and at some point they are considered just as, as symbols, that is to say, as, as useless things from the epistemic point of view and having only a kind of uh, 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 explanatory intent. So what is, what is happening, uh, and Echo calls this the stylization of icons. I think we can apply this concept of stylization to diagrams in the early modern age. So what happens is that in some texts they just disappear and in some other texts they remained there but in a kind of stylized version, in the sense that they were not employed in the proof, but they were just there in order to illustrate what was going on. So for instance, this diagram from a medieval treatise is, is, is clearly just an illustration, because you are not performing any theorem there. This diagram from Comandino is an icon, that is, you are using this diagram in order to perform the proof. If you have not this diagram, Comandino's proof would not work. This diagram, very similar, by Borelli, 
is not an icon anymore because Borelli's text does not refer to this diagram and, and there is no use for him for the diagram itself. So you have these three diagrams and you see the first and the third are similar as far as their use is concerned because they only illustrate things. The second one, the one by Comandino, is the real diagram that matters in the demonstration. So you see you have a kind of evolution of you have an evolution of the way in which you look at diagrams, even though they may remain similar throughout the centuries. So it is an important history, I think, in order to see how the material support may remain the same, but nonetheless, the intentional value of what you are looking on, uh, what you are doing with diagrams is changing. And so all these images of, of Euclid 1.1 have very different values from, from an epistemological point of view, because some of them are used for demonstration, some are not, some are used for, for some demonstrations and, and some for some other demonstration, and, 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 and so forth. Uh, 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 uh. So this was more or less the story that I wanted to, to uh, 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 tell you. We do need a, a, a history of diagrams in, in, in mathematics and in epistemology. We, uh, and there is a lot still uh, to do, and, and, uh, and uh, this history has important epistemic consequences because it deals with the ideal of proof and, and the very notion of what is a demonstration and what is valid as a demonstration. And at the same time, we see that this story is quite complex. It, it cannot be just dealt with a, a story before the 19th century and after the 19th century, and rather it has a lot to do with the notion of space and the philosophy of space, which comes from, from, a, from a completely different uh, 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 perspective. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Vincenzo, for this wonderful uh, uh, lecture, like Lectio Magistralis. Uh, before concluding our ceremony today, it is necessary to thank many people, all the present uh, here in, in the room that uh, were here in this very difficult period. The Pan pandemic is not finished, uh, unfortunately, but uh, and many other difficulties we, are, we have uh, facing in this moment. And uh, I have to thank uh, particularly uh, Pierluigi Graziani, that was, uh, as always, uh, Deus Ex Machina all over the organization of this wonderful event, and a, a, a great expert uh, on uh, proof in geometry. I have to thank uh, Professor Tarozzi that is not here, unfortunately, because he is a bit sick. He's the director of uh, the Interdepartmental Center for Philosophy and Foundation of Physics, one of the institutions that promote this kind of study here in, uh, in our university. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not useful to thank uh, Laerte <laughs> Sorini, because he is one of the jury of the, of the presentation. Laerte is the, the director of the center Urbino e la Prospettiva. And uh, last but not least, uh, I have to thank uh, Janita Lobiski. Uh, I don't know if he is still here. Yes? Ah, oh, he's, not, he's no longer here. Uh, Janita Lobiski is uh, is uh, the, ori the origin of all, of all, of all this because it was, uh, it was an idea of him uh, 20 years ago to uh, establish in the center of uh, Urbino La Prospettiva that is directed now by Laerte and promoting the, the studies of history of science here in Urbino. And uh, I, I conclude with uh, an amusing uh, anecdote uh, uh, that uh, Gianitolo told me about uh, the problem of diagram in mathematics. <laughs> 
You know that uh, Diedonet was a very great mathematician, a Bourbakist mathematician, so he don't like very much uh, diagrams. He said always that it is one uh, never have to use diagrams when, he is making, when uh, one is making mathematics. And, and Gianitolo told me that uh, some, someone uh, told him a legend about Diedonet. Diedonet was lecturing. And at a certain point, I was embarrassed, I was not able to understand how to go ahead. He, he went in a corner of the, of the blackboard, hiding the, the blackboard to all people, make a very small draw, a moment after, immediately cancel it all and begin again to, <laughs> to the proof of the theorem. <laughs> so diagram anyway are very important for, for, for making mathematics. Thank you very much.